The following program presents principles designed to promote good health. It should not take the place of personal professional care. Viewers should always consult their qualified health practitioner before considering alternative treatment. Welcome everyone to our Natural Remedies Seminar and I'm going to be going through a few natural remedies tonight. You see the human body was designed to heal itself and it'll heal itself if you give it the right conditions. And there's a little book that I often use, it's called The Ministry of Healing and there's a chapter in there called The Physician, The Healer and it's not just for the physician. It's actually for all of us, because we should be our own doctors. And it says in there that nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual, and the impatient, it seems slow. And it says that when you give the body the right conditions, it will start to heal itself. And something else it says is that we need to have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. One of my favourite pages is 127 of, of this book, and it's in that chapter, The Physician, the Healer. And it says in there that in case of sickness, three things should happen. Number one, the cause should be ascertained. Wrong conditions changed, or unhealthful conditions changed. Wrong habits corrected. And then the fourth one is, then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system. And that's what I'm going to do this evening. I'm going to show you some of those things that you can do to the body to bring about a healing condition in the body. My book at home is heavily graffitied <laughs> because of all the things that I've underlined in it. And what I love about this book, it looks at healing not just physically, but also mentally and spiritually and emotionally. So it's an excellent book that I'd like to, to promote. So let's have a look at some of the things that you do to, to boost that healing in the body. The first thing I'm going to have a look at is the humble onion. Now the home I'm staying at the moment, the onions are all very little, so we've actually got a whole heap of onions that we're going to use. And I'm going to show you some of the things that you can do with onion. And I'm, I'm very thankful to Onion. It was the first poultice that I ever did. I was 26. My eldest daughter was 16 months old. Actually, when this happened, I was 25. And she got an earache. And because I've been trained as a nurse, and I was interested in back to nature, being a hippie, but I didn't know what to do when the child was sick. So I went to the doctor, the doctor put Emma on antibiotics because everyone said, don't play with the ears, she'll go deaf. Do you know, we should never make decisions on fear. We should make decisions on fact. So of course, I thought, I don't want my child to go deaf. So I went to the doctor who put the child on antibiotics because he said she had an ear infection. So within about 24 hours of being on the antibiotic, the, the earache settled down. The course lasted for five days. Within 24 hours of stopping the antibiotics, the earache came back. I didn't know what to do, went back to the doctor. Six weeks later, four courses of antibiotics later, the earache comes back. Now what's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results, but I didn't know what else to do. I was ignorant, as so many are. So I went back to the doctor. He's writing the fifth course of antibiotics, and I was really challenged. I said to him, one question, will my daughter be on antibiotics for the rest of her life? Am I coming to that conclusion? He was challenged by my question. So he said, hmm, I'll give you a referral to an ear, nose and throat specialist. I went to the ear, nose and throat specialist. He looked in Emma's ears, he looked in Emma's mouth, he said, the child's teething, give her these drops to keep the eustachian tubes clear. That was it. You see, our eustachian tubes are tubes that connect our eyes, our nose, our mouth, our ear, 
I have since learned that wheat and dairy and refined sugar are three of the main causes of earaches in children. Let's fast forward. Two years later, child number two is about the same age. Child number two gets an earache. I do not go to the doctor. I went to the old lady next door. I was about 26 by now, and she was 86. I said, what did your mother do when you had an earache? She said, mum would steam up an onion on the stove. So I went home, I steamed up an onion in the stove. When it was all soft, I wrapped it in a cloth. I put it on James' ear. James fell asleep. James slept for two hours. What does that tell you? He's not in pain. James woke up happy. All day, I'm following him around. I can't believe it. <laughs> I can't believe it. Four courses of antibiotics, six weeks, and a two-hour onion poultice. No wonder that experience set me on the path of natural remedies. So it's with great joy I show you how to make an onion poultice. So you steam an onion on the stove, and you steam it like this. It's got to have that little core there which will hold it all together. Now steam it or dry bake it. If you boil it, some of the healing properties will go into the water. So steam it or dry bake it. And when it is soft, you cut it in half. And you cut it in half so that you're looking at the rings. And what you can do when you've cut it in half, remember this is hot and boiling, squeeze some of the juice into a teaspoon now that will be boiling, but when it's squeezed into the teaspoon, the cold teaspoon of course will cool it, and you can put that into the ear. And then you will wrap this up. And you can wrap it up with a, a, a tea towel, or a hand towel, a cloth, or maybe even a chucks. Now most onions are a bit bigger than this. <laughs> Usually I would do an onion that would fit your ear. And so you, you wrap it up until you can bear that temperature. And then that surface area there, you would put straight on the ear. And then you cover it with a piece of plastic. What did they do before plastic? A square of wool, and you certainly, you're in New Zealand, the land of sheep, you can certainly use a square of wool. And then you might put a beanie on, you call those beanies, those little woolen hats, or you might bandage it on, or sometimes the person might lay down with that into the pillow, you see that? But you, if you can keep it warm, you keep it on. So as long as you can keep it warm, you keep it on. Now what will the onion do? The onion is a drawer, and it will draw the inflammation, reduce the inflammation, it'll break down um, any pussy areas and that can be taken away from the, through the bloodstream. Sometimes it will do just that. It will reduce the swelling and that will be taken away through the bloodstream or sometimes the ear will make a hole and the pus will come out through there. Don't worry if that happens because if the body makes a hole in the ear, it'll easily heal and how else does the pus get out. Now if someone pokes a sharp instrument and makes a hole in your eardrum, you're in trouble. But if the body does it, the body knows what to do. You just got to give it the right conditions. How do you know what the right conditions are? Well, I knew this was the right condition on James because what was the result? He slept. He was in no more pain. Mm -hmm. See that there's some of your signs. The body will speak to you. So a cooked onion on the ear is one of the best things for earaches. How long do you need to keep it on? Well, as long as it takes. When it gets cold, take it off. If the earache returns in a few hours, put it back on again. <laughs> you just keep doing it until the body says enough. In fact, one of our workers, she wore an onion poultice for a week. Every day to come back, so every day she'd go back on. Who are you listening to? The body. And she would get relief. Ah, the body's going, that's what I want. After seven days, no more earache came back. Sometimes we don't know why. This lady eats and lives really well. Maybe something was just coming out from her childhood, or maybe she had a gluten and a dairy intolerance then, and, and maybe she had a lot of earaches then. You know, sometimes we don't know why. But the body knows why, and it will tell you if this is the right thing to do. 
Now I'm going to look at a... Uh, well, there's one other area for cooked onion, and that is on a boil. And with a boil, let's say that knuckle is a boil, you steam it, and of course you don't put the boiling onion right on. You let it cool. It'll cool quite quickly, and when, it can, when you can cope with it, you put it on, and you put a bit of plastic on and bandage it on. And you might leave it overnight. You might leave it all day. You can leave it for a while, and that onion will draw it draw the waste into itself and when you take it off, often when you take it off, everything comes out. It's drawn it all into that area. So it brings relief because what you've got, you've got the heat which will bring everything to it and you've also got the, the drawing healing properties of the onion. So they're the two places that you can use cooked onion. Now we're going to have a look at raw onion and often when you cut an onion, what happens? You start crying, is that right? And that's a good illustration of what the onion does. It's very good at clearing all the eustachian tubes. So it's a good time to cut up an onion is when you've got a cold. And what you can do with a baby, you can't do a lot with a baby, obviously, but you can, if they have a cold, you can cut up an onion or slice up an onion and you can put it on a plate in their bedroom and they will breathe in the onion fumes and it will help to clear the airways. And it's a fairly old remedy that to cut up an onion on a plate will help to take the fumes out of a freshly painted room. Also, if you've got a bad smell in the fridge, obviously you must remove the cause of that bad smell. But if you put a chopped onion on a plate, it can absorb any of the bad fumes that may be lingering. Um, after the offending article has been removed from the, uh, from the fridge. So raw onion um, can be used like that. Now there's another remedy for raw onion and you might be surprised at this one. And this remedy is for a cough. Let's say someone's got a, a bad cough and I, I'll give you an, uh, a story to illustrate. I was at my daughter's house in America and she had a little, she's got a th little three-year-old boy and she put him to bed. He had a bit of a cold and we were listening and he coughed and he coughed and he coughed and he coughed and do you know what it's like? You just think he'll go to sleep any minute. Half an hour later, he's still coughing. So I said to Emma, get him up and we'll put the onion poultice on his feet because up near the face, up near the eyes, it can irritate, so we'll put it on the feet because the feet are a reflex for the rest of the body. Specifically, the feet are a reflux for the chest, the feet are a reflux for the head, and the feet are a reflux for the abdomen. So what we did was we chopped up the onion like I'm doing right now, and we got two little plastic bags. Now, James is only three, so Little onions is good for a little one. And we put about uh, a tablespoon of onion in one plastic bag, and we put a tablespoon of onion in another plastic bag. And then we put his feet in the plastic bag. So his foot, the bottom of his foot, is sitting on the onion. And then you pull the plastic bag up around his ankle and put a sock on, and then put him back to bed. So what's he got on? He's got his feet in the onion bag and his feet, uh, the bottom of his feet where the biggest pores are in the whole body are sitting on the onion. Now, not one more cough. <laughs> and he'd been coughing for over half an hour. Not one more cough. Now I know you're going to be keen to try this one and it is so simple. <laughs> Does the onion burn the bottom of the feet? No, it doesn't. And he slept with that on all night and there was not one cough for the rest of the night. So it's an amazing treatment, so simple and yet so powerful. I had a lady ring me. She was about to be admitted to hospital with pneumonia. She's 23. She said, I don't want to go to hospital. I was admitted a month ago. I was put on strong antibiotics that made me so sick and it didn't really help. She said, so pneumonia is a pretty bad situation. So I said, come, we'll do what we can. We had a program on, so it was convenient. 
And I said to her, just a little tip on your way, she had a five hour drive. I said, cut up, on, cut up an onion, put half in one plastic bag, half in the other bag. Now, sorry, she didn't have to drive with the onion on her feet. <laughs> her boyfriend was driving. And I said, put your feet in those plastic bags and put a sock on. Well, she thought that was pretty strange, but she was willing to do anything. When she got to our health retreat, she was just smiling. She said, I'm, I'm in awe, she said. <laughs> What that, she said, it, it lessened my tightness. She said, it seemed to open my bronchioles. This is on the feet. Very simple treatment. Now, she was with us. When she came to us, she was on Ventolin, she was on cortisone drugs, and she was on anti-inflammatories. And we did some hot and cold water fermentations on her lungs, her chest. We'll tell you about that one in a minute and we put onion on her feet every night and we got her inhaling peppermint oil and um, within the third day she was off all her medication. She started to walk up the hills with all the other guests and she had just finished her nursing and that was a year ago. She's now been six months a naturopathic student. <laughs> she said, I know where I'm going now. So she'll be an excellent naturopath. Now what I'm going to do now is make onion syrup. Now this is one of the best cough syrups that you can make. And it is so easy and everyone loves it. Especially when the children aren't used to sugar. Which my children weren't. I've put a layer of chopped onion in a jar. And now I'm going to put approximately a teaspoon of honey. This must be good honey, it's very thick. And you know, the best honey is thick honey. So that's about a teaspoon of honey. Now another layer of onion. Another teaspoon of honey. Needs two hands. Now by the end of this evening, a syrup should have formed. Can you see what I'm doing there? Now I'm putting another layer of onion. Now because I don't want to spend another five minutes peeling and chopping another onion, this is all I'm going to do, but you certainly can fill your jar. So another, we'll put an extra dose up on, we'll put maybe two teaspoons of honey on the top. And I'm glad we've got this thick honey, because all honey should be like that. Do you know a lot of honey has got glucose syrup in it, which is just sugar water. So whenever honey is thin and runny in the winter, get worried. <laughs> it's got sugar in it. And my children used to put honey on their porridge, and you know they dig it out like candied honey, but as soon as it goes in the porridge, it melts. So can you see that? It's a great illustration because the Honey's quite dark. Now, that honey's just sitting there with the onion, but in, in about an hour, you'll see a syrup formed. Now, this is a cough mixture, and if someone's got a bad cough, they can have a teaspoon of that three times a day, or a child could have a half a teaspoon three times a day. So if your child's coughing very badly, give them a teaspoon of onion syrup, chop up the onion in two plastic bags, wrap it on their feet and put them to, get, to bed. You sh they should and you should have a nice sleep that night. So that's another thing that you can do with the onion is the onion syrup. Now, a member of the onion family is garlic. And Garlic is a very powerful antibiotic, but if you want to use it as an antibiotic, you should take four cloves a day. That's quite strong. So here's a clove of garlic, and how you can take it when a person's got a bad cold is as a flu bomb. So I'm going to write the recipe for flu bomb up here. So flu bomb. And when you taste it, it'll seem like you've just drunk a bomb. <laughs> garlic. Now, someone loves garlic, they might have two cloves. 
but approximately one clove. And if I was doing it for a child, I'd use a very tiny little clove, and that's crushed. The next ingredient is ginger, and we'll be talking about ginger this evening. And this is about a quarter of a teaspoon, and that's finely chopped. So they're the first two ingredients in the, th in the flu bomb. The third ingredient is the juice of a lemon. It's usually one lemon juice. And the next ingredient is honey, and usually one teaspoon. The next ingredient is eucalyptus oil. Or you can use tea tree oil, one drop, that's it. And the next ingredient is cayenne pepper. And we'll be talking about cayenne pepper later this evening. And I'll just leave that one free because for some people it's a light shake. For other people who are very brave, it might be half a teaspoon. So I'll just leave that one up to you. Now all of these things are put in half a cup of hot water and then you drink it. Now you don't have to chew up the ginger and the garlic, you just throw it down. And if a person's got anything from pneumonia to bronchitis to asthma to um, the flu to sinus problems, any respiratory problems, that will bring relief and it usually brings relief for about four hours. So my suggestion is if you have such a complaint that you have three or four a day. And it's usually best with a meal because if you put all that <laughs> heating herbs onto a raw stomach, cast iron stomach wouldn't hurt, but a tender stomach might feel a little bit sore. So you might have that before you have a nice big bowl of hot steaming soup, which is very nice, a thick soup when you've got a cold. So that's the flu bomb. Now you can't give a flu bomb to a baby, can you? So what can you do when a baby's got a cold? When a baby's got a cold, you can wrap the garlic on the bottom of their feet. And how you do this is you finely slice the garlic. Now when my children were little, we lived in a place called Dora Creek and our yard backed onto a swamp and my children used to get a lot of chest colds. So I was always doing little things to them. Do you know, we moved from Dora Creek and there were no more chest colds. So you do have to look at why, if a child's continually getting a cold, it might be an allergy to a food or it might be living in a damp house. You know, mold is a terrible cause for respiratory problems. So can you see what I've done here? I've, um, I've put the two fine slices of garlic on the cloth. And then I put the piece of cloth over it because I don't want that garlic on the, on the baby or the child's feet because it will cause a blister. Onion will not, but garlic will. But if you put that cloth between the garlic and the baby or the child's feet, it, it will not blister the feet. And then let's pretend that this hand is the child's foot. Then you just bind this cloth around the foot, so the garlic's on the bottom of the foot. And then you put their sock or their little booty on and uh, you can leave it there all night. Within about four minutes, you'll smell the, the garlic on the baby's breath. Again, biggest pores in the whole of the body and on the soles of the feet. So you can often use the soles of the feet to get medicines into the body. Now my little son James, well he's 38 now and he's certainly not little anymore, but he particularly used to get chest colds. So I would put this on his feet in the morning, put the sock on and put his shoes and socks on and he'd run off to play and every step he takes, what's happening? <laughs> he's pressing that garlic in and little by little, when you slice it, it allows the garlic juice to go in little by little. If you were to crush it, too much juice would come out, that's when the blister could 
could form on the soles of the feet. And if a blister does form, it's not a big deal. It'll heal. You just can't put any more garlic on till the blister has healed. Now, at the end of the day, when I gave James a bath, I would take his shoes and socks off and take this little bandage off, and the garlic looked like dried out bits of yellow leather. There was no more juice in it. Uh, now, the body knows what to do. In Psalm 104, verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. So you put garlic on the bottom of a child's feet, the garlic juice and the actives will get into the blood and the body knows straight where to send it, where there is a need. That's the beauty of herbs. They work with the needs of the human body. Science calls it synergism. Now we're going to have a look at ginger. Ginger is one of the best anti-inflammatory herbs that we have. Probably on equal to it, especially internally, would be turmeric. And earlier in the week I talked about taking high-dose turmeric, say capsules, as an anti-inflammatory if someone has inflammation in the body. And we've had some great results with that. But what I want to show you tonight is how you can use the fresh ginger. Now you can use the fresh ginger internally and externally. Internally you can grate it on a very fine grater and then you put it in a little teapot, pour boiling water with it and it makes a delicious ginger tea. Now that ginger tea can to be given to someone regularly if they do have inflammation. I guess the beauty of taking the turmeric capsules, you can get really high dose at once. You can also give it to a person if they're cold. Now when I was in Bali um, a couple of years ago, whenever you have a massage, they always give you a cup of ginger tea <laughs> straight after the massage. By the taste of it, it's got a little bit of sugar in it as well and I don't advise that. I actually think that it doesn't need uh, sugar because it's such a, such a sweet bitter is the ginger. Now, so internally it can be used to warm up the body, it can be used to reduce inflammation, and it can also be used to settle the stomach. If someone has nausea, upset stomach, you give them a ginger tea and it will relieve their nausea can be great if uh, a woman's having uh, morning sickness, but you might all like to know this very important point. Morning sickness is a magnesium deficiency. And some women suffer for months and months. So all they need to do is get magnesium. <laughs> Take even four doses a day. So morning sickness is a magnesium deficiency. Meanwhile, waiting for the magnesium to kick in, which should kick in fairly quickly, you can give them some ginger tea to relieve the nausea. So that's how you can use it internally and you can use it externally. Now where ginger is particularly helpful is in joint inflammation. Now in a minute we're going to look at another vegetable that you can use for tissue inflammation, but this is specifically joint inflammation. So this will be, say, a sore lower back. It can be uh, arthritic pain. Um, it can be um, arthritic pain or gout pain. It can be used for any inflammation in the joint area. And how you make it is you would get a, a cloth or you can get a chucks. And what I do is I fold over glad wrap a few times and then I put that down and put the cloth on that and then you grate it. I don't peel it. If it's dirty, you'll need to wash it. And then you grate it on a fine grater and this is also a great way to do uh, the ginger tea. One of my favourite recipes for breakfast, which I might have about once a week, is scrambled tofu. And I crumble up the tofu and I've got a grater that's got a handle and then a really little grater handle and I just put it over the saucepan and I grate the ginger and the garlic <laughs> straight in. I put some turmeric, oil, salt and herbs and it's delicious. So of course you can use uh, ginger in all your cooking. It's great in your legume dishes. I know that Indian cooking use it a lot in their dals and it can also help with the digestion of, of the legumes. 
But as I showed you earlier in the week, most people don't rinse their legumes enough. You've just got to remember that the water you cook the legumes in is dirty water, and that has to be washed away. So I'm just putting, getting this grated ginger out of my grater. And I'll hold this up so you can see. So there's my grated ginger. So on such a fine grater, it's like a pulp and you can spread it out. So you spread it out. Now I'm just saying, let's say this is for a, uh, a sore lower back and a lot of people have sore lower backs. And what we have to do is we have to listen to our body. If you're doing something and your back's a little bit sore, you've got to stop. <laughs> Many backs get sore because people keep doing things when the body says stop. And a lot of people don't lift things with their thighs. You should never lift with your back. You should lift with your thighs. So if your back is straight and your knees are bent, you will lift with your thighs. So you've got to look after those backs. So what I'm going to do now, and I'll do it up here so you can see, I'm going to pull one side over and then pull the other side over. I just need a few more pairs of hands here. So what I have done is I've made a little parcel, you see that? And the area that only has one layer is the area that's going to go on the sore knee or the sore elbow or the sore wrist or the, uh, or the sore back. And notice when I make my poultice, I've got about a centimetre all the way round of plastic. And that will just help so that the the moist, the moist ginger juice isn't going to soil the sheets or the clothes or whatever. And then I'll, um, Amelia, could you come up and I'll demonstrate on Amelia how I'll put it. Let's say Amelia has got a sore elbow. Okay. So let's say her joint here is sore. I'll put it on like this and then I'll wrap it on with a bandage. Now what will happen is if there's inflammation in that joint, that, now you make sure you don't have it too tight to strangle the limb and you also don't have it too loose so that it'll fall off. It's very important that you take a lot of effort to make sure that poultice is well covered with the plastic and it's bandaged on properly because there's no fun, bandages falling off, poultices getting all through the bed, there's no fun at all. So let's say Amelia's got a sore elbow. Maybe it's bursitis, maybe it's tennis elbow. Medicine's found lots of names for sore elbows, but mostly they're inflammation. Now what you can do is you can tape that on with a bit of tape or you might have a safety pin or those things and that'll clip the bandage together. Now what I always do with poultices, I always ask God to bless poultices. So I'm going to give you an illustration of what I'll usually do, especially if this is a guest, and sometimes we have guests who have no belief in God, but it's very important to ask God to bless your poultice. So I'll say, do you mind if I pray for your poultice? And they use, oh yes, they don't mind at all, see? Oh, see? And I'll say, dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for Amelia, for her elbow. Please bless this ginger poultice in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know I found people love you praying for them. Now, if there is inflammation in that joint, the skin is going to get very, very hot. It appears that the ginger pulls out the inflammation from the joint to the skin. And some guests have said to me, Barbara, my skin is burning. And I say, can you handle it? Because if you can handle it, thank you. If you can handle it, just keep it on all night. And some people, especially if they have especially if they have uh, arthritis, the heat feels very, very nice. 
One lady said it was just burning me and I say, well, if you can endure it, keep at it because the heat will often go up and then ease and then it might get hot again and then it will ease. And some people get very, very fearful, but it'll never burn the skin. It will never burn the skin. But the fact that the skin gets hot is an indication that there was a lot of inflammation in that joint. And it can feel very nice if someone has a sore lower back. And what you can do is you can actually put it on that area. It's hard, especially with us ladies, to bandage that because we've got waist and it fall up to the waist. But I find if you've got a sore lower back, you just lay on it and often your pants can hold it in place and just lay down on your back with your knees in the air and the heat will come in. Now, if someone's got a sore lower back, often they'll put a hot water on their back, hot water bottle. Now, the hot water bottle brings a bit of relief because when you're in pain, the muscles seem to go out in sympathy with your pain and they tighten. And the hot water bottle relaxes the tight muscles and that's what feels good. But if you've got inflammation and you put a hot water bottle on it, it can increase the inflammation. But if you put a ginger poultice on a sore lower back, It'll pull the inflammation out of the joint to the skin. That heats up the whole area. The muscles relax. And of course, the joint inflammation, because it's being relieved, it is no longer sore. So it's excellent for such things. And I'll tell you a story about a man who did our program. He was a barrister from Melbourne. And in our first consultation, he's 38. He said, I'm here to stop drinking for a week. And I just want you to tell me me to tell you, he said, I'm not going to stop drinking. I'm just stopping for a week. I just nodded. That's all I do, nod. I'm the scribe, and I just write it down. He was a very quiet man. And um, when we got to our poultice night, I talked about how the ginger poultice can relieve inflammation. And he said, um, I've got gout. He said, I've got one little toe that just sticks up like that. He said, I'm a barrister. I have my wig and my robes on. He said, and I have to wear slippers. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> and he said, this little toe has been sore for 18 months. I nodded, as I do. I said, would you like us to try a little ginger poultice? Now, we made a tiny little ginger poultice, and we wrapped it around his little toe, and then I put a bit of plastic on, and I put a little bit of tape. This is called micropore or leucopore, and it's like a paper tape, and it's very gentle on the skin. And I said a little prayer, and he went to bed. Now, the next morning, he was coming down the hill. He's a very quiet man, and we could hear him yelling. <laughs> Before he got to the health centre, he said, it's gone! It's gone. His toe was flat and there was no pain. <laughs> 18 months he'd had that problem. Now the next day I gave the lecture on the acid alkaline balance which we had last night, didn't we? And in the, in the lecture on the acid alkaline it shows that alcohol is very acid forming as is meat. He was a high meat eater too. So in our final consultation he said, um, <clears throat> I'm going to stop drinking. <laughs> and I'm going to greatly reduce the meat, he said. All because of a little tiny ginger poultice. <laughs> he had relief. He was so excited. So the ginger is great, remember, for joint inflammation. That's the best place to do it. Now, for tissue inflammation, potato, the humble potato. Now, the potato is very good at reducing tissue inflammation. So this would be something like a, a swollen infected finger. It would be something like a swollen ankle. Um, and sometimes you might have a swollen knee and you'll think, well, do I do potato or do I do ginger? Well, do one for a few hours, take it off and do another one for a few hours. Your body will tell you what is best because sometimes you don't know whether it's joint or tissue inflammation. And what you do is you just grate that potato. We've got a tiny little potato, but that's usually all you need because if you do too much, it becomes too wet and there's nothing worse than leaking poultices. And the lady of the house will not be happy if there's potato juice on her sheets because it's not easy to get out. 
In fact, our laundry lady has asked us, please don't do any more poultices at night in the health retreat, because the sheets were getting a bit stained, but you can certainly do them through the day, as long as you make sure you wrap them up really well. There shouldn't be a problem. So here is the, here is the potato poultice. And this would be a good size for a knee, say a sore knee, sprained ankle, like that. And you put it, you, again, you make the poultice out of it. Now, with the potato, it's very alkalizing. And when you've got inflamed tissue, it's very acid. And potato is high in potassium and phosphorus. And both of those are absorbed by the skin to help with the healing. So you can see, again, I've got an area around my poultice so that when you put it on the skin, like I did with Amelia's poultice, the plastic well covers it. A few stories about the potato poultice. I was um, at a friend's house here, it must have been 18 months ago, and I was seeing a lady. And when she came in, her little boy came in too. And her little boy was about seven, and he had a sore finger. And I was immediately drawn to his sore finger. His finger was swollen almost twice the size. It was all red with a pussy top. I said, what's happened to the finger? And the lady said, well, the doctor says it's cellulitis. Do you know what cellulitis is? Just inflammation of the cell. That's, that's all cellulitis is. Well, that's obvious that's inflammation of the cell. I said, hmm, what have you been doing? She said he's on his second course of antibiotics. He's on painkillers and sleeping tablets at night. Seven. I said, hmm. Um, did anything happen to that finger? See, the detective hat has to go on. Did anything happen? Oh, he had a blister. And then he played in the dirt. And the blister broke. And the dirt got on the skin. It's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> and of course, as soon as the dirt got into the blood, then the body reacts by sending white blood cells, inflaming the area to try and protect the area. I said, aha. Uh -huh. I said, do you mind if I try something? She said, please. I said, well, what I'd like to do is get two cups. One cup's got hot water, the other cup has got cold water. And in the cold water, there are blocks of ice. It's a hydrotherapy treatment. So I shall write this one up. So what we did, we did three minutes in the hot water, and we did 30 seconds in the cold water. And the reason this works is that hot is a stimulant. Because we know if we get into a hot shower or a hot bath when we're cold, oh, it stimulates, doesn't it? It's a stimulant. But probably within about five minutes of being in a hot bath, how do we feel now? We feel like falling asleep, don't we? So initially, hot stimulates and then it slows right down. So I put his finger in the hot water, but I'm only going to put it in for three minutes because by three minutes, everything's going to slow down. And then I put it into the cold. What happens when you have a cold shower? Has everyone been trying their cold shower? <laughs> it's a stimulant, isn't it? But if we were to go and dive in the cold creek in the middle of winter, very quickly, we start to slow down. In fact, in about 30 seconds, everything starts to slow down. So can you see what we're doing here? We're using the stimulating time of hot, and by the time, it, before it can slow down, we whiz over to the cold and wake it up again. And before that has time to, cold down, to cool down, we go back to the hot, wake it up again. Can you see what we're doing here? And you do that three times. More than three times can exhaust the body because this is dramatically moving the blood. You see, the blood is the life of the flesh and that finger needs more blood. And that wound 
In that wound, the blood had tended to sit and pool. So bringing fresh blood in drives the stagnant blood out. And when the fresh blood comes in, it's got oxygen, it's got nutrients, it's got water, it's got white blood cells, everything that that finger needs to heal. Now with the little boy, I had the hot water and I said, put your good finger in and tell me if you're comfortable with that temperature. Can you see? This morning we talked about the will. You've got to work with the will. And if that little boy said, I don't want to do this, I would say, okay. Can you see that? A man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. But I find children are easily won. I say, do you know that this will really help? Would you like to give it a try? See, you show great respect to children and they show great respect to you. And it's only when I get that nod that then I will do it. Anyway, he agreed. He was sick of this finger. <laughs> sick of the pain he was going through. And so he put his good finger on. I said, is that good? He said, yes. I said, put this one in. If it hurts, pull it out. And he pulled it out straight away. <laughs> I said, just keep putting it in, just keep putting it in until you can bear it. And then eventually he could bear it. And then we timed three minutes. And then back to the cold. And the cold feels quite good because you've been so hot. Now while his finger's in the cold, I put a bit of boiling water in the hot. And then I say, put your good finger in. Are you happy with that temperature? Can you see? You've got to work with the will. He nodded. After 30 seconds, back in the hot. And he could bear it a little bit hotter this time because his finger's been in the cold. Can you see that? He did it three times. And when I'd finished the three times, how long did that take? Ten minutes? He had a big smile on his face. I would say by looking at his body language, his pain level had reduced by about easily 50% in ten minutes. Now that's quicker than any painkiller. Maybe IV morphine might be quicker. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Brought incredible relief. In fact, hydrotherapy has been used for centuries. And in the area of pain relief, there is no equal to it. And then I put a grated potato poultice on his, because he had a lot of tissue inflammation around there. And when he left, he just had a smile on his face. The mother said, what will I do now? I said, well, you can do that every two hours if he has discomfort. But I think it was something like uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. I said, maybe do it again about two and maybe do it again before he goes to bed. And every time you do it, put a fresh potato poultice on because that potato is going to start drawing out the waste and you want that thrown away. She said that when they got home, the little boy said, can we do that again? Why did the little boy say that? He had experienced it. Mm -hmm. And the mother, I think we got feedback that the mother, I think it was the next day. Yeah, my friend is here. <laughs> I think it was the next day, wasn't it? She said that all the stuff came out. So I so, so did another potato poultice at about two, another potato poultice before bed. And when she took the one off in the morning, all the stuff came out. So naturally, that potato had opened the wound. Never put a knife or a, or, a, or a scalpel. No, 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 let the body do it. You see, I used to work as a psychiatric nurse and I worked in the operating theatre. Brutal. Surgery is brutal. This is not brutal. This is very gentle, but it's a very powerful way to operate. Now, if I broke an arm and my bones weren't matched, I'll be very thankful for a surgeon <laughs> to reset my bone. You know, there, there, there may be a time. But, you know, there are four doctors that get me to go to their town and give these meetings because they know that if everyone had this knowledge, wouldn't that cut down casualty visits in a powerful way? They're just simple things. Do you know, if you're not getting a response, go to the doctor. <laughs> but you know, I never have had to because the body always responds. No need for that little boy to take antibiotics. No need for that little boy to take painkillers or sleeping tablets anymore. Just hot and coals and a grated potato poultice. Isn't that amazing? 
So simple. The mother said, what will I do with his second course of antibiotics? I said, well, I don't have any authority over your son's medication, but I can tell you what I would do. Now, I don't usually have to say anything else because that is quite obvious. <laughs> but in 15 minutes, we got more results than he'd had, had for the time. I'm not against antibiotics. They have saved lives and they will continue. But you know, most people should go through their life never having them. Remember, this is just life saving that they should be used for. So the humble potato. I have a couple more stories because it's such, such the humble potato is a powerful thing. When I was living in the rainforest many years ago, when my children were little, we had a guy living on the property who was a real hippie. He was sickling the grass with a sickle, you know, the old fashioned sickle, and he was doing it barefoot. What's going to happen next? <laughs> and it went right into the back of his heel. I heard about it and then I didn't hear anything for a few days. And one of the guys said, have you seen Chris? He's in his caravan, the, that's where he lived, the foot's swollen up twice the size and there's this red line coming right up his leg, almost to the groin. And he was lying in bed smoking marijuana, waiting for nature to heal. <laughs> nature will heal if you give it the right conditions. I said, bring him up. And I did hot and coals. I couldn't do the hot very hot. I, I, I could, and when I put someone's foot in, I usually put my hand there and dip it in and I watch their face. You can tell very clearly by their face if they're handling it. And if they can't handle it, just cool it down a bit because you know that after the first coal dip, they can handle the hot a little bit more. And so I did hot and coals three times. That brought his pain levels down again by about 50%. And then I did the biggest grated potato poultice I've ever done over his whole foot. You see, he had an internal wound and it had sealed on the outside. Now that is a perfect environment for tetanus. Do you know it's horses that carry tetanus and we had horses in the paddock and tetanus can only get a hold in the body if you've got an internal wound that is healed on the outside and not on the, ins on the inside. It's got to heal from the inside out. I said, come back in two hours. He could limp now before he couldn't even walk. He came back in two hours, he was limping. I did the hot and coals again. I did the grated potato again. But when I took that poultice off, the wound had opened. And that's what you want. You want that wound to remain open until it heals from the inside out. I think I did it uh, again before he went to bed. And then in the morning, and by the way, every time I, he came back, the red line's going down down, <laughs> down. Now, if that foot didn't go down, and if that red line didn't go down, we would have turned straight to hospital. Mm-hmm. But it did. It did. And that's why I say, try this. If you're getting results, what's the body saying? Yes. If the, what's the results? The results is reduction in swelling. Results are reduction in pain. So, you, so you're looking for the body's response. The next day, the foot was almost back to normal, the red line was almost gone. He said, what'll I do now? I said, just keep an eye on it. You're probably all right now. But if the red line creeps up, we just go back to more. I said, that wound must keep open, keep an eye on it. So I just let him deal with it. I said, if you need more help, I'm here. <laughs> I wonder how long he had, maybe another week? Because he had the perfect environment for tetanus. My little grandson, he trod on a rusty nail, he's three, went through the crock, right up into his foot. He'd been playing in dirt all day, so he's covered in dirt. When they brought him to me, my daughter-in-law, he was covered in dirt. What's the first thing you do? Bath. <laughs> it's just basic common sense. I put him in a bath, and that calmed him down too. And then I got a grated potato poultice, about this big, wrapped it on the bottom of his foot, bandaged it, put a sock on, and put his little crocs on. And that's it. Of course, said a prayer over it. Uh, that night, my son William, he did another grated potato poultice after his evening bath. William said to me, he only did it at night, 
Through the day there was no swelling, there was no pain, so he left it, and at night he did the potato poultice. After the third night, William came to me and he said, Mum, look at this poultice. And it was the poultice that he'd had on all night. On top of the poultice, there were little shavings of fluorescent blue metal. The grated potato poultice had pulled the metal out of his foot and cleaned the metal up. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, isn't it? And they didn't do it again. That's it. Did he have a tetanus shot? No, he didn't. There is no need because his foot was given the conditions required for healing. And those tetanus shots sometimes can be quite nasty. Death by tetanus is not a pretty picture, but most of the times it can be prevented by just immediately working on the wound that is there. One more story of greater potato poultice. My girlfriend Lindy rang me. This is when we all had our babies together and I could hear her little boy Louis screaming in the background and I said, what's the matter with Louis? He's 10 months old. She said, he, she said I don't know, but his little penis is swollen twice the size and he's screaming. You know, sometimes you don't know why. And, and if you take him to the hospital, what are they going to do? <laughs> I said, make a greater potato poultice quickly. See, how long did that take me? Not long at all. That's why it's good. Over the next week, make yourself a poultice box. Buy a plastic box, call it poultice box and get your little squares and your little graters and all your bits and pieces so if there's a crisis, it's just there. And you'll be very thankful. So she put this on his scrotum, then put his nappy on, and she said he stopped crying in about five minutes. You see, whenever you've got swollen, painful tissue, the cool grated potato poultice is very soothing, and that immediately starts to cool the area. Little Louie slept for a couple of hours. She said she kept going in. She wanted to know if he was all right because he was finally sleeping. He, poor little chap was probably exhausted too. When, when he woke up, she quickly changed his nappy and everything was back to normal. Now, sometimes you don't know why. He's a little crawling baby. My girlfriend was a hippie. Maybe he was crawling in the grass. Maybe a grass seed got there. Maybe an ant bit the area. It's hard to know. But no matter what the problem, if ever you see swelling in the tissue, you put the grated potato on. And for joint, you put the, the ginger poultice on. My son James, he works out, you know, and he, he was working out too much a few years ago and his whole arm swelled up. So he remembered what mum used to do and he put a grated potato poultice over his whole arm and bandaged it up. In the morning it was all back to normal except for the the joint there. Looks like that little one will do well with <laughs> onion on the feet tonight, hey? <laughs> and we'll give her a dose of this soon. Can you see the syrups forming? The syrup's already forming. Usually within 24 hours it's all done and you strain it. Let's go back to James and his swollen, swollen elbow. He went to the doctor and the doctor said, that's bursitis. What's bursitis? Just inflammation of the bursa, which is the fluid around the joint. He said, take this antibiotic. James stood up and said, I've never taken an antibiotic in my life and I'm not about to start. And he left the surgery. Do you think the doctor's ever heard that? He certainly didn't need an antibiotic for that. And you know, there's a big push today to get doctors to stop prescribing so many, because when people really need it, they're not working. So James rang up mum, and mum said, put the ginger on. So he put the ginger on, he said it got very, very hot, but he put it on one night, reduced down half. Put it on the next night, and by morning it was, all the inflammation had gone. Very simple things, and yet powerful. Now, if you don't regularly use ginger, you can freeze ginger just like that. And you can just grate it frozen. So I know that if you have ginger in the fridge and you don't use it, it, it can mold. So that's a good tip to know that you can, you can freeze it.